time for us to check back in with Verna May and see what happens next. If you missed any of the previous readings, just look in the description below for a playlist. My husband's parents were very different in temperament and personality than my folks, but just as great in their own way. My mother-in-law, Larcy, who was also a Sloan before she was married, was the daughter of Isom at one time. There were eight Isom Sloans living on Caney and Pharisee Sloan. Her father and mother had separated when she and her brother were very young. Her father remarried. Her mother raised her and her three sisters and two brothers. Fairy, as everyone called her, worked very hard to support her children. She lived to be very old. In fact, she outlived almost all of her children. Larcy, in growing up, had worked as a hired girl for different families. She had stayed a lot with Merlin Stone. She had thus learned to be a very good housekeeper and one of the best cooks in the whole world. Her biscuits were a meal in themselves. As I had stayed at the community center for so many years, I did not know how to cook for a family. My mother-in-law taught me how to cook. Of course, I never became the expert she was, but my husband could not use the phrase, so many men do, you don't cook like my mother. Larcy was one of the few women whose extra pounds added to her appearance, not taken from it. I guess I loved her so much that she would have been pretty to me anyway. I think she filled the place of the mother I never had. She sensed this and accepted me as one of her own, even scolding me along with her own girls. She was so full of love and understanding that she seldom scolded anyone. She so loved to laugh. I've seen her get so tickled over some prank or mischievous doing of the children that she would shake all over and the tears would stream down her face. She really used the hillbilly way of talking. I remember one word in particular. She pronounced the word child as chow. My children loved to get her to repeat this word and she would pretend to let them trick her into saying it. She was such a jolly, lovable person that you would never dream she had suffered so many heartaches. The mother of 14 children, seven of them dying when babies. When two of her sons, Elbert and Ranson, were drafted into the army during World War II and sent overseas just a few years after her husband's death, the emotional strain was too great for her and she had to spend a few months in a mental hospital. Although her mind recovered, physically she was never well again. A few years later, she died from a kidney infection. One Christmas morning, at about the hour she had so many times in the past awakened to fill the children's stockings with goodies, Jesus called her home. Larcy did not care to tell anyone that I was her favorite daughter-in-law, but I did not find so much favor in the eyes of my father-in-law. Yet if he had lived until I became more grown up, I think he would have liked me better. He was a very conservative, serious person who seldom smiled, and he took plenty of time to consider the answer to any question, no matter how small, before committing himself. He did not like to do hard work, but he was not at all lazy. He just thought it better to make a living by the way he managed his affairs. He had a real talent for trading, swapping, and bartering, buying something from one neighbor and selling to another, always with a small profit for himself. It seemed a much needed service to the neighborhood. In the spring of each year, he would go to the bank and borrow 50 or $60, a large amount at that time. And with this loan, he would buy the few things that demanded cash money. By making his small deals by fall, he would have enough to repay the bank and a few dollars for winter essentials. Many of Mrs. Lloyd's friends from up north sent used or second-hand clothing. These were sold in a store called The Exchange. It got this name because in the beginning, when Mrs. Lloyd was just establishing her school, the Creek people, residents of Caney, exchanged their surplus vegetables and fruit for these clothes. The clothes are now sold for money. My father-in-law would buy a lot of these clothes and then go from house to house peddling them, again making a small profit, also being a big help to the people who did not have the time or chance to go to the exchange themselves, especially mothers with young children. 
On his weekly visit to the community, he also visited the school library. How that man loved to read. He would sit for hours on the porch in summer and by the fire in winter, reading, unmindful of the noise around him. He loved novels, but his favorites were autobiographies of the presidents or great men of history. He was a far-seeing man, very seldom speaking his deep thoughts. When Willie was in the CCC camps, his father wrote and told him, Son, come home. The United States is preparing for war. He was a very brave man. Once in his younger days, he was out drinking with several men when a dispute developed into gunplay. Shade was shot, and the men, thinking he was dead, ran off, leaving their hats. When Shade came to, he took time to cut up all their hats with his pocket knife. Then following them, he really gave them a run for their money. The men thought they had shot him through the head, but the bullet had only gone through the flesh part of his jaw. He was one of the few people at the time who had cancer. He first took the flux, a contagious stomach disorder with diarrhea. This kept lingering on until cancer developed. There was very little that doctors could do for cancer. He lived for almost a year. He gave himself over into the hands of Jesus, joined the church, but never became physically able to be baptized. A few weeks before he died, he refused to take the morphine drugs the doctors had prescribed for him, saying he wanted to know when death came and he thought it was just for him to suffer if Jesus had suffered for him. I think this took a very brave man to endure that much pain and refuse the morphine. There was a terrible rainstorm threatening the evening he died, and his last thoughts were of his children. He looked up and asked, Are all the children in out of the rain? I think the grandchildren have ancestors to be very proud of, and I hope they never forget that. In the mountains, visitors are always welcome. No invitation is necessary. It is just taken as a matter of fact that when you go to someone's house, you will be welcome and asked to share dinner or supper, as the case might be, with the family. In fact, it would have been counted as an insult not to be asked. Shade and Larcy sure fed out a lot. I don't remember ever going there, but what I would find a house full of folks. Some people would take advantage of this custom and outwear their welcome. I know many a time Lacey would be so tired and worn out from a day's work in the field, doing up the work, feeding, milking, getting supper, and washing the dishes, when just as she would have had her children tucked in for the night, here would come a whole family, mother and four or five kids. So Larcy would go and feed these extra ones, washing the dishes again, then making beds down by placing feather beds and quilts on the floor. She would make room for them. She never complained, was always smiling and making them feel welcome. She really enjoyed having them. Myself, I would have thrown a fit. Watts Fork is, of course, the home of the Watts. Squire Watts and his wife Sally moved here from Lyons Fork. Sally Watts was a midwife or granny woman as we called them. In fact, her name is on my birth certificate. Watts Fork is just across the hill from Caney. When Squire divided his land with his boys, a mountain custom, John Watts got the head of the holler, Woe Leary next, and Hiram third. The place belonging to Woe Leary is of most interest to me, for in the early 20s, Shade, my father-in-law, bought this farm and moved there. Up until then, Shade had been a renter. In the mountains, there is no social distinction made between a landlord and his renters. A good renter is well thought of. The renter was given use of a house, garden patch, and pasture. He could tend as much corn as he wanted to, giving the landowner one-third of the corn raised. If fortunate enough to have some of the few acres of bottom land, then the price was one-half of the corn. The renter usually took pride in the upkeep of his home. Of course, there were some renters who were not worth their salt. Shade was a well-liked renter with a large family that raised plenty of corn for himself and the landowner, but he longed to own his own farm. Sometime in the early 20s, he got his chance. He paid for his farm in a very interesting way. At that time, the people who were sentenced to jail terms had to work for the county while imprisoned to pay their fine, another good law of the past, 
no longer enforced. I think if some of the folks who go to jail had to work, they would not be so eager to get in. Many prisons today have a higher standard of living than the taxpayers who maintain the prisons. The county had promised to build a new county road across the hill connecting Watts Fork and Caney. This was very badly needed by the people of both places. It gave us a wagon road to Hindman and the residents of Watts Fork a route to the community center and school. So Shade got the job of overseer. He was sworn in as assistant jailer. He boarded the prisoners for $1 each and received $2 each for each day's work they did on building the road. They were most all friends and neighbors of his, not desperate criminals, so they stayed in his home with his wife and children. Most of the food was grown on the farm, so most all the money could be saved. This way, he soon had enough money to pay for his farm. Lots of times he would let the men go home on the weekends to visit their families, trusting them to return. Of course, this did count on their sentences. Only once did a man betray his trust. When the man failed to return on Monday morning in time to work, Shade waited until dark and taking some more men with him, he went to get him. They surrounded the cabin. When Shade called to him and asked him to give himself up, he ran out the back door into the arms of the deputies waiting there. Soon he had handcuffs on him and he spent the rest of his term in jail. Ballard, the oldest son of Shade and Larcy, was more of a father to the other children, working whenever he could after his father became too sick to work. I remember he used to keep bees and always had honey for their own use and some to sell for extra money. He also raised cattle and pigs to sell. He was married once, but the marriage was annulled. She was a very young girl, and I think he realized his mistake. It sure did not bother him any when she left after a few days. I remember one day he was trying to kill some rats that were digging in under the cellar. Just a few yards from the main house was a split stone cellar where the canned stuff, mason jars filled with vegetables, berries, and fruit were kept, along with potatoes, turnips, apples, etc., on top of this cellar was a frame wooden smokehouse. Here the meat, shucky beans, smoked apples, onions, popcorn, walnuts, etc. were stored away. Ballard had found a hold dug under the cellar walls and he decided to lay away Mr. Rat. It wasn't long until a bullet from his 22 found its mark and there was one less rodent. He gave the rat to his small brother to bury and patiently began his watch for another. Ransom decided he would have some fun at his older brother's expense, so he took the dead rat and going into the smokehouse, he let it down through a hole on the end of a long string directly over the rat hole. He just let its nose stick out the hole, then jerked it back. His brother could see the rat, but he could not see Ransom. Soon he shot again, and Ransom let the string drop. I got him, said Ballard proudly but I guess he would have spanked his younger brother had he been able to catch him when he pulled the rat out and found that long string tied to it. A bean stringing was a social event as popular in its day as a dance or a car race now. Shucky beans, or leather breeches as they are called in some localities, is a very delicious dish that has never lost its popularity. Most everyone who has eaten them gets addicted we all still dry beans in almost every home on Caney, but we only remember and talk about the bean stringings. When the beans are still green, some lets them get a little more mature than maybe other folks, but to each his own preference. I like them almost full grown. The beans are picked and the strings pulled off, then strung on twine like beads, letting the beans cross each other on the string. When full, the twine is looped and hung over a nail on the porch or behind the stove. There they remain until completely dried out. Then they are put away until winter. We now put them in freezers. They are cooked like soup beans or navy beans with a piece of hog's jowl or salt pork. They have a nut-like flavor. We usually serve them with cornbread, pickled beets, or sauerkraut. But a bean stringing was a social event. Then families dried bushels of beans. We had no refrigeration and only a few glass jars, which cost cash money. So every bit of food that could be preserved by drying was put up like that. 
All families helped each other work, but when work and fun could be combined, so much the better. So when the beans began to come in, there was a bean stringing at first one house, then another, all up and down Caney. The girls would meet and pick the beans. It was a very hot, uncomfortable job as the beans were planted in the corn, which grew far above our heads, but we laughed and enjoyed ourselves, even when bitten by the worms known as pack saddlers. Sometimes the boys would come and help us carry the beans to the house, but most always we would rather they did not because we did not like for them to see us in our old clothes. The beans were poured in the floor in the middle of the room. After all the work was done up and us girls had all spruced up, then the neighbors began to arrive, bringing their darning needles with them. At first, everyone would snout the beans, pull the strings off, when a good supply was ready, some would begin to put them on the twine. Of course, the boys and girls would pair off in couples and work together. Some boy or man would bring a banjo or fiddle and play music if the homeowner allowed it. Many of our folks were against music, saying it was of the devil and a sin. After the beans were finished, the mess cleaned up. Maybe there would be a dance, again, depending on the beliefs of the homeowner. But if not a dance, there would be games, hang the doorknob, please or displease, fine or super fine, who's got the thimble, and many others. Nice, clean, wholesome fun. Some of the boys would walk the girls home, others would ride with them on their mules. I attended many a bean string and where Willie would also be with his guitar or banjo, but one I remember in particular. When I invited him to come to my brother's where there was to be a bean string in the coming Saturday, he asked me for a date, and I hope I did not say yes too quickly. But my dreams were shattered when I rushed to tell my niece that finally, at last, I had a date with my feller. It seems he had also asked her to be with him that same night. To tell the truth, I did not believe her at first, but it was so. When the night arrived, we were both so angry that neither of us even spoke to him. I did not know until many years later when we were married what had really happened. Willie's cousin wanted a date with my niece, but fearing she would tell him no, he got Willie to make a date with her for himself. They thought when she saw him, Willie with me, that she would be with the cousin for spite. That was kind of a mix-up that backfired in both their faces. I don't guess any of this is interesting to anyone but me. I don't know just where the following should be placed in my story, but I feel I should slip it in somewhere as it was a part of Caney history. I believe the little, small, unimportant things have their place in the makeup of our lives and the history of a place. And they tell more than the larger things. Do any of you remember the Lee or Mason Manufacturing Company? I think they were located in Chicago, Illinois, but I'm not sure. Every spring we would receive a small catalog from each or both, full of all the small wonders, rings, pens, dishes, perfumes, pots, pans, silverware, and much more. The last pages were of premiums. By selling an order of the small items, you were allowed to obtain one of the larger for free. This was of a great help to the women of Caney. Many of them never got away from home to go shopping in Hindman or Whalen. Our small stores did not carry the things found in these sale books. In 1929, when I was 14, I remember getting up an order for the Lee Company, and I earned a set of dishes with a bluebird pattern and a wooden porch swing. I took my book and visited each and every home up all the haulers, Orchard Branch, Short Fork, Sparkman Branch, Trace, Bunyan, Onion Blade, Booger Branch, Hemp Patch, Cotton Patch, and Holly Bush. Almost everyone ordered something. Even if they did not, I enjoyed the visit and they liked to look in the wish book. My father had to go to the Lackey Depot to pick up the large barrel, which had been sent by freight. Then I delivered the articles to all the homes. Of course, I walked and enjoyed it. The pack peddlers were also a very useful part of our lives. Every spring and fall, one or more would make their rounds. They were always welcome, often sharing a meal and staying one night. Oh, the joy of watching them open those packs. I never could understand how they packed so much in small bundles. 
They always had foreign accents and their prices were low. I remember well the last one I ever saw. It was October 31st, 1940, the day my second son was born. After that, the war began and the pack peddler came no more to Caney. Some say their supply was cut off and some folks tried to say they were German spies. So another fascinating look into the life of Verna Mae Sloan. Um, I really liked this part in this last little part we were reading where she says, I believe this little, small, unimportant things have their place in the makeup of our lives and the history of a place, and they tell more than the larger things. I really like that. I've always been fascinated by thinking about that. It is the small things. It's the little tiny things that make up our lives. You know, you think about uh, when your kids are little and just how they how they talk among themselves and hearing them play in the distance or or maybe you remember you know your mother cooking supper or or laying down at bed in the bed at night and feeling how cozy and warm it is sitting by the wood fire all those little pieces uh, the first bloom in the garden the first tomato the first green bean all those things um, they really do kind of make up our lives so I really liked that part when Verna May said that I think she was very wise uh, in that regard I like the part, uh, how it started with her. She didn't know how to cook because she'd spent so much time wanting to be educated and wanting to go to the community center and, and learn and, and do those things. She wasn't focused on actually learning how to cook. When Granny and Pap was married, first married, Granny jokes that she couldn't cook. Now, uh, she come from a really big family and in those days, most girls did cook, but she said she always helped with the housework and her sister Genevieve was the one that was interested in cooking. So she said, I just never learned to cook. I just did other stuff. I did have to work, but I just never did do much in the kitchen. So she says that Pap taught her to cook, that he, he knew how to cook a little bit and he taught her. I know she also did learn a lot though from her mother, Gazzy, from her sisters and from Pap's mother, uh, Marie. It was interesting, the part about Verna May's father-in-law Slade how he didn't like to he was one of those people he didn't it wasn't that he was against hard work but he just thought he would he'd make his life a little easier and he was someone that liked to trade uh, I, I've known people like that I bet you have too not necessarily that did that as a full-time living but that kind of always on the side had something going where they traded this and they traded that uh, I have one of my first interviews that I did with a great friend, Josh. He's like that. He's always wheeling and dealing about something. Uh, if you missed that interview, I'll link to it. He's very interesting. I need to go back and talk to him again. Dear family friend. But he's like that. He's always kind of wheeling and dealing. And I'm like, I could never figure out how to do that because I, would, I think I'd always just end up giving my giving it to somebody and, and not making any money back. So if you're going to do it serious, like Shade, of course, you'd have to figure out how to how to make your money back, especially when he, he took out a loan to kind of kind of jumpstart his every year. Also interesting was the, you know, that he got shot. Thankfully, it just went through the flesh of his jaw and not through his actual bone or anything. But um, I, I, the funny part of that one is to me, it's not funny, it's horrible. Horrible that they were fighting and horrible that he got shot, but as he took time to cut up their hats, he cut up all their hats before he went after them. Uh, so I guess that shows how mad he was that he was gonna he was gonna do in their uh, hats, make sure that they couldn't come back for them before he went out after them to to get them. I don't know if he you know it makes you wonder what was the rest of the story. Did he find them? Did he did he have them arrested? Did he end up fighting with them? You know what happened uh, to the rest of that story? Wonderful to hear about the shucky beans. We call them leather britches here in my area. If you've never had leather britches, I have a video I'll link to, but they do have a very unique taste. Totally different than, than green beans, whether they're fresh or canned. Just a totally different, way more intense flavor. Nutty, I guess she said, and I guess I would say that nuttiness, just a, a smokiness is what I think of. But interesting, uh, not just for Verna May, for me reading this, but I've always been interested in that, is when you think about if you had to preserve a large amount of food. Well, today, we could just kind of, if, you know, if you have the money, you could just kind of go keep buying cannon jars and just keep canning and canning and canning. But they didn't have that luxury then. So, but they also depended on what they had, so they had to dry so much stuff. So they eat lots of leather breeches, and that would be an easy way when you think about 
especially if you had a, a bean stringing like they did, but when you think about actually just stringing them up for later use, that's kind of easier than going through the process of, of pressure canning the way we do things today. Uh, and I'm sure they did that more and more as time went by, and I'm sure that's why leather bridges kind of fell out of out of fashion. I just I, I didn't grow up with leather bridges, but I do know a lot of people who did. Um, they they don't do enough to make them all winter usually, but what they do is make sure that they have a mess for Christmas and a mess for Thanksgiving, and maybe a mess for Easter or for a birthday, something special, just to hold on to those old memories. Um, so I, I'm always interested in hearing about those old food ways. It, um, she mentioned, I, I like this part about the old clothes. I've always been a big proponent of that when you're doing something outside or whatever. Even when I was little, I guess Granny and Pap taught us that. Put on your old clothes so you don't ruin your good clothes. So it's kind of like I have old clothes and I have good clothes. Um, both of which, some of them are many, many, many years old. When we were first married, Matt sometimes would make fun of me with my get-ups, he called them, that I would wear sometimes if I was working outside. Um, and he, he even would tease me and tell me it must run in my family because he'd seen Uncle Henry in some of the same get-ups. So um, I liked that part. And also when she mentioned pack saddles, she called them pack saddlers. I've never heard that. We just say pack saddles. But they hurt if you've ever been stung by one. They, and the corn patch is a good place cornfield is a good place to get bit by them. Um, they sting not like a bee. I would describe it more like an electric shock. Uh, they're really cute little furry looking caterpillar bugs. Uh, really interesting to look at but they do sting. It's, it's just like you've been like an electric shock and it just kind of lingers on. It's different than the sting of a, a wasp or a yellow jacket or hornet or something. Um, but I, I thought that was pack saddlers, she called them, so I thought that was interesting. All those wonderful games she mentioned uh, several years ago, quite a few years ago, I wrote about games, old games, on the Blind Pig and the Acorn, and Displease or Displease, that was the only one she mentioned that I, that I had wrote about, so I'll link to that post below if you, if you want to go read it and find out more about those games. I really loved learning about the games uh, back when I wrote about them. You know, some of them you still hear kids talk about, maybe hide and seek, Hoop, whoopy hide, whoopy hide, whoopy hide, some people called it. Um, seems like there was another name some older people called it. Maybe Red Rover, but a lot of those you just don't hear, even the ones from my childhood, like Red Rover and Bum 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 that we would play. You just don't hear, especially Hide the Key, those kind of things. That kids talk about them. Blind Man's Bluff, that was one. There was always going to be somebody get hurt when you played that one. Always, always somebody was going to get hurt. Um, but you don't hear kids talk about them as much today. It's kind of sad. I guess uh, technology has took their interest away and there's so much to entertain them that they don't need to be entertained by those simple games that, that we all used to play. The date mix up with her husband, that part was funny. And that, that does sound like some kind of crazy harebrained ideal that, uh, that they come up with where that she would be mad because Willie was with v Verna May and then just out of spite decided to go with his cousin. So that was funny. Uh, reminds me of one time uh, a friend, he actually was going to date my friend. That was really the only reason we were friends. And uh, they ended up getting married and they're still married. So all that worked out. But at this time, so I was kind of the go between between them trying to help them set up. And he had come in from where he was living and he brought somebody with him. Well, he thought the perfect thing would be to set me up on a blind date with him. And uh, I just was, wasn't really interested in that. And he was trying to tell me about it. And of course, we were just talking on the phone in those days, no cell phones. And I can't remember if I'd seen him, maybe. And then he tried to fix me. I don't remember how it went, but I do remember on the phone call, I was just like, no, I'm just not, you know, I was just kind of being real blunt about it. And then later I found out that he had let him listen on the, <laughs> on the other line in their house, in his house. And I was so embarrassed. I thought, oh my goodness, the poor boy, I pray hurt his feelings. Of course, I didn't say nothing mean, but I was just very adamant that I, I was not interested. So that's what it reminded me of. And then the ending, kind of when she's talking about uh, getting up an order, that's another thing that's kind of fell by the wayside that people don't do. Uh, of course, at schools, sometimes they're selling different things. 
but I remember getting up an order, hearing people say stuff like that. And some of, I just remember I always looked forward to it when Granny would either have or be invited to like a Tupperware party, a Hoda, home interiors. I'm sure there was more. Those were just so fun. Uh, of course, it'd be a lot of women from the community. There'd always be some food. And then there'd be all the, all the whether it was Tupperware or, you know, uh, Hoda or home interior type stuff just so amazing to see all those neat things and and if you were the hostess then you got to think well if, you know depending on what people buy what do i get to pick out what do i get to pick out after i was married i had one of those kind of type parties and i can't remember i have no memory of the name of it now it wasn't home interiors but it was like that it was stuff for your house and i had i did well and i got some stuff and i still have some of those things that i bought all those years ago with that uh, it's funny, but I don't really hear about anybody doing that today. When I worked at Tri-County at the college, um, one of my friends sold Pampered Shelf, and sometimes uh, she would get up and order just there at school. She'd say, I'm going to order, so if anybody wants to, to get in on it, um, I'm sure it helped her out, but then we didn't have to pay shipping or whatever, so it helped us out too. So that's kind of a thing of the past. I remember, though, it seems like in school, especially when Steve was, like I was littler, I'm five years younger than Steve, when he would bring home stuff like that that he was going to sell, I'll get so excited about it, looking at it, whether it was the, you know, different candies or uh, one time he had this whole pack, like it packed into a suitcase of all different little items. And I remember I bought several of them. That was, I was older then, uh, maybe middle school age or something, but for Christmas for people, or maybe I was, yeah, I would have had to just be in middle school because he's five years older than me. Maybe that was my pack. No, I don't think so. Anyway, I, I would always get excited about it, kind of like Verna May was uh, exciting. I, I really remember, too, in those elementary school days that Steve sold these, like, religious plaques. They're just kind of press board paper. I bet you've seen them. And maybe it would have the, the little kids going across the bridge with the angel. Maybe it would have Jesus praying. Uh, I can just see one of those in a thrift store or something like that. And it just, I just get the warmest feeling. And I think it, of course, it's because it's a beautiful, you know, sentiment on there. But I think it goes back to that wonder of Steve selling them and me getting to see them. Uh, there used to be one in Granny Gazzy's house. I guess it's still there. And I wondered, is that one Steve sold? And I'm sure all the schools in this area was probably doing the same thing. So it could have been one from someone else. But uh, good memories like Verna may have. I hope you enjoyed this part of the book as much as I have, and I hope you'll drop back by next Friday if you've got to see what happens next. And please do leave a comment and let me know what you enjoyed about this part.